at first sight, they are respectable citizens. But in reality, people with dark impulses and savage killers. They live apparently normal lives. In the US, the Milwaukee monster puts his victims in the freezer and submerges them in acid. The manager says, hey, I thought, what stinks in your apartment? He said, well, my fish died. In Russia, investigators find 70 bodies in a river and don't know who is behind it. If you don't have the identities of the victims, there's no place to start. In Germany, a daughter discovers after her father's death he was a serial killer. You almost have to narrow your focuses and try not to torch yourself over the things that you'll probably never get answers to. How are psychopathic serial killers hunted down? Investigators are put to the ultimate test, for these are among the most ruthless criminals in the world. Russia, Bitsevsky Park on the south side of Moscow. 22 square kilometers in area, intended as a place for people to relax. They come here to play chess, to picnic, or simply to enjoy a walk. But a killer is on the loose. Bitsevsky Park is his place to commit crimes and his refuge. Earlier, he had always played chess there with his grandfather. It was a source of positive energy and where he started to kill people. It became a place where he was the master. A frightening development. Between 2005 and 2007, people regularly find dead bodies in Bitsevsky Park, around 40, all male. Almost all homeless, alcoholics, socially deprived. The police aren't doing the best of their job, at least in the beginning phases, before they realize it's a serial. You find that the crime scenes aren't really properly done because of who the victim is. These were people maybe that society didn't consider very worthwhile. In October of 2005, another murder is committed in Bitsevsky Park. The police finally have to react. A special homicide unit is formed. At the crime scene, Detective Andrei Supronenko finds hidden in the bushes a dead man, Nikolai Vorobiev, brutally murdered. No one who saw him will ever forget how he looked. Like a schnitzel beaten with a hammer. We imagine several possibilities. Someone must have been very angry, a psychotic man or a woman. We also discovered that the killer had been very careful. He left no evidence. He took everything with him that he touched at the crime scene. The autopsy reveals the man was most likely hit with a hammer. Supronenko searches for the weapon in the park to no avail. Hammers are rarely used in homicide cases. It's a very up close and personal weapon. In a way, he tells me he wants this to be over very rather quickly. So it's not about the killing. It is perhaps just literally about the number. The investigator's first destination, a psychiatric sanatorium near the park. Perhaps one of its patients is the killer they're searching for. We checked out the people being treated for psychiatric problems in this hospital. We looked at what kind of patients were here, what diagnoses, and what profiles they had. We checked if they could leave the hospital property, if they could disappear for a night or longer. We found no evidence of that, so we closed this avenue of the investigation. The investigation hits a dead end. No evidence at the crime scene. No motive. No weapon. 
Supronenko takes action and combs the entire park with 200 police officers. They question all passers-by. In the process, Supronenko discovers a suspicious person. He seems nervous, perhaps in part because police are there. While searching the area, we discovered a man wearing women's clothing. He ran from the police, which immediately made him suspicious. He was in the part of the woods where the killer had last struck. We even found a hammer in his bag. Naturally, we checked him out right away. But he had an alibi, so we had to let him go. The real killer continues to creep around the park and even feels provoked by the false arrest. He says, well, I'm going to show you that the guy you have in custody is not your guy. He was furious. He was outraged. He, these were his killings and he wanted the credit. And as a result, he redoubled his efforts. He killed more people and kept on killing to show the police that they were wrong. In April of 2006, he strikes again. Inspector Supranenko heads to the crime scene. The victim lies hidden in the bushes among the trees. This time it's a woman. Branches are stuck in her head. Insertion of objects into the body may well suggest to some a sexual component. It's typical that as a serial killer goes on that the crimes increase in severity. So there is maybe more sadism and so you do see an escalation of severity of crimes over time as we see in this case. But this time the detective makes a crucial discovery in the pocket of the victim's pants. When searching her clothes, we found a subway ticket. That showed us which subway station she had used and the precise time of her arrival. The subway ticket is the long-awaited clue. Will it actually lead to the perpetrator? The ticket tells investigators at which station the victim entered and exited the subway. Andrei Supranenko reviews the security camera videos from the day of the murder. And gets lucky. The woman appears accompanied by a man. Is he her killer? The day after we found the body, her son contacted the police and reported his mother missing. At the same time, we were reviewing the security camera videos and saw Mrs. Moskalyova leave the station with a man. They went in the direction of Bitsevsky Park. The mother had left her son a message with a number and the name of the man with whom she intended to go for a walk. Pichushkin. But who is this man? Pichushkin was born on April the 9th, 1974. He grows up with his mother and sister on Hersonskaya Street, in a typical Soviet-era apartment block near Bitsevsky Park. His childhood is marked by poverty, his father rarely home. As a small child, Pitshushkin has a bad fall with serious consequences. That he had an accident in his childhood when he fell off a swing, and it's believed that that gave him some brain damage and to the front of his head, and these are the part of the brain that control emotions and aggression and behavior. 80 to 90 percent of serial killers, and about the same rate of general murderers, had some sort of brain trauma. And so there's a huge correlation between brain trauma or, or brain damage to some extent and going on to later kill people in adulthood. Pichushkin's grandfather takes care of him and teaches him to play chess. 
His grandpa taught him chess. He was good at it. So Pichushkin nearly always won. Each victory helped him overcome his inner aggression. As long as his grandpa was alive and regularly played chess with him, his aggressive outbursts were almost neutralized. But then his grandfather dies, and Pichushkin's outbursts intensify. In June of 2006, investigators discover his address. They place his apartment under observation and ultimately arrest him. Inspector Supranenko interrogates him, but the suspect keeps silent at first. At night, we got a call that Pachushkin wanted to talk now and would confess to Moskalyova's murder. Once he admitted it, we knew that we had to get him to talk more. Initially, I acted skeptical in order to provoke him to convince me. As he told us more and more details, we understood his character. He wanted us to recognize his achievements, so we started to treat him with respect, as if he were a hero. We did that to keep him talking. They hadn't caught them in all these years with all these killings. And it's so good to boast to the police that you are better than them. Investigators make an incredible discovery when searching his apartment. During the search, we found a chessboard in his apartment. Almost all the squares had numbers stuck on them that he had cut out of the newspaper. After each murder, he stuck a number on the board, assigning each murder victim a square on the chessboard. He wanted to kill 64 victims, the number of squares on the chessboard. But what Supranenko still lacks, the murder weapon, the hammer. Investigators take the accused back to the scenes of his crimes. The idea is for him to show them how he killed his victims. Supranenko also hopes that he will tell them where the weapon is. At the crime scenes, Pichushkin comes out of his shell. He shows everything precisely. He gives the impression of reliving the crimes. Pichushkin could recall every small detail that interested him. The time, down to the minute. The date the murder took place. That was important to him. What didn't interest him were the clothes the victims wore. He couldn't remember that well. When we interrogated him in the office, he was dull and bored. But when we went to the crime scene to check the details, he was lively. He enjoyed it. This was his real life. The strategy of bringing Pichushkin back to the crime scene to talk works. He even leads investigators to the murder weapon's hiding place. Divers recover it from a small pond in Bitsevsky Park. It was important to find the murder weapon so that we could prove the killer had used it. When we found the hammer in this pond and examined it, we discovered that a small piece of it was missing. And one of the victims had precisely this piece lodged in his head. That made us 100% certain he was the killer. Investigators now have the killer, the confession, and the murder weapon. Pichushkin is indicted on September the 13th, 2007, for the murder of 48 people. Pichushkin keeps silent the first couple of days, but as he notices how much attention the trial generates, he begins to talk. Pichushkin shows no remorse. He testifies that he would have continued killing. He says, 20 of you are judging me, but during the murders, I was alone and decided myself who should live and who should die. I was like God, but I showed him that he was no God. My job was to put him in jail, and what he felt about it does not interest me. A person is only an object for him, on which he can demonstrate his greatness and power. I'm sure he was thinking, I'm very intelligent, although everyone completely underestimates me. The trial lasts six weeks. 
On October the 29th, 2007, the court sentences Pichushkin to life in prison. He's still serving time. People in Moscow can breathe easy again, but other killers are even more ruthless. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. As in this case, the killer has sex with dead bodies. Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee monster, puts bits of dead bodies in his freezer. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most prolific and most renowned serial killers in the world. The worst case in the career of Detective Dennis Murphy. It's our job to remain cool. Your duties are to convict the guy and make sure he's found guilty. Dharma kills at least 19 people in a way never before seen. Milwaukee on the night of July the 22nd, 1991. A man discovers an acid drum with body parts in the apartment of his friend, Jeffrey Dahmer. What officers find in the apartment is sheer horror. A freezer full of body parts. Detective Dennis Murphy doesn't yet suspect that they're arresting one of the most ruthless killers in American history. At 3 o'clock, I get a call from Lieutenant Vaughn. He says, you got to get in here. we got a guy that's got 10 or 11 skulls in his apartment. And of course, I said, yeah, you're, you're pulling my leg. But I had other words for that. But I, I didn't believe him. And he said, I'll get back. And I hung up. Then he called me back, he said, I'm serious, get in here. So then I went into work right away. While his colleagues collect evidence, back at the station, Murphy proceeds with hardened concentration. He must get Dharma to confess. I spoke with him for 17 hours the first day, over 17 hours. And then the next day, I believe it was 16. And by that time, we had the full confession from him before his attorney could come in and say, hey, I want to talk to him. And when he did, Dahmer didn't want to talk to him. He signed a release saying, I don't want to talk. After three days, Dennis Murphy breaks the killer. Dahmer begins to confess. And what he says sounds unbelievable. It all begins in the Ambassador Hotel, the Milwaukee monster's first crime scene. Here, Jeffrey Dahmer kills his first victim, a sexual partner, Stephen Tuomi. And then he had a problem to get rid of the body. So he went to the surplus store down on Wisconsin Avenue, picked up a used suitcase, brought it back, put Tomei in the suitcase. He was a strong individual, and he could lift it with no problem, so he'd handle it himself. Dahmer has incredible luck. Neither employees nor guests notice anything. Detective Murphy can barely believe it. Not much unless there was a complaint or blood was dripping out of a suitcase and someone saw it, but there's no complaint in the rooms next to him if there were people in the rooms at that time. So if there's no complaint, there's nothing to stop him. Dharma takes a taxi from in front of the hotel and rides home with a body stowed in the trunk. On the side of Dharma, it must have given him a, a great sense of satisfaction that he was able to get away with this. At the time, Dharma is still living in a suburb of Milwaukee with his grandmother. He dismembers Tuomi's body and stows it in the basement. Detective Murphy can hardly comprehend what he's hearing. I spoke with the grandmother herself, and she said she had hearing problems, and she kind of had a suspicion that Jeff liked boys, but she wasn't sure. Jeffrey Dahmer is a homosexual. Two months after his first murder, he lures two more young men to his house and kills them. Then he has sex with their dead bodies. So drugging them or 
killing them first and then having sexual behaviours probably just made him feel more comfortable because he didn't really have that ability to interact with people. People can reject you, they can leave you, etc. Et I don't like them moving. I don't like them talking. I just want them laying there. Well, that's what you get with a dead body. Detective Murphy discovers that Dharma nonchalantly throws the body parts out with the household garbage. The Milwaukee monster leaves the garbage can at the curbside. He showed no outward features. Like many serial killers, they live apparently normal lives. They get on with their life. They are polite. So for the police, until they get a clue, until they get a lead, it's very difficult. Dharma's story begins in the small city of Bath, Ohio, population 10,000. As a young boy, he tortures animals. In Jeffrey Dharma's case, his early interest in injuring animals and to examining road kills is clearly a pointer to where he was going to get to in his life. This low empathy probably continued into adulthood and the target simply changed. Dharma kills his first victim when he's just 18 years old. He takes hitchhiker Stephen Hicks home with him and beats him to death. With the body in the trunk of his car, Dharma is stopped by police, but he talks his way out of it. And in fact, they were really close at the very beginning of his murderous career. Probably was a big confidence booster for him that he was able to manipulate the police and act calm under those circumstances. He begins his career as a murderer. In May of 1990, Dharma's grandmother kicks him out of the house. The Milwaukee monster moves out into the Oxford apartments. Now he can kill as he pleases. In the summer of 1990, four more murders. Dharma begins to eat pieces of his victims. You could say in sex in general, there's a desire to have a piece of someone else inside of you. I think you could say that there, it may have been a, a, an overflow of that, a manifestation of that desire to feel his lovers inside him uh, by eating them. More and more men die in Dharma's apartment. What Detective Dennis Murphy still does not understand, why no one on the property reports the smell of the decomposing bodies? Well, they did smell something, but when they went to Dharma's apartment, the manager says, hey, I said, what stinks in your apartment? He said, well, my fish died. Corpses in his room for two or three days before he disposed of them and cut them up. He'd put them in acid and then flush it down the toilet and break the bones and throw them in the garbage when the garbage men came. The detective discovers the police actually could have arrested Dharma much sooner. On May the 27th, 1991, the police receive a call from a young man in Dharma's apartment. He's afraid of the killer and begs for help. The police believe it's just a fight between two gay men. Now one might say, but how, how could that have happened? But at the time in Milwaukee, the police had a lot of criticism for how they dealt with the gay community. And as a result of this, they were very hesitant to get involved in any sort of gay dispute between, possibly, potentially between two lovers. It's very frustrating, I think, for law enforcement to recognize, especially in Jeffrey Dahmer's case, that they were really, really close a couple of times. The police leave the young man in the apartment, a fatal mistake. After they departed, um, Dahmer murdered this 14-year-old boy. Detective Dennis Murphy finds out Dahmer often picks up his victims in nightclubs. In his apartment, he injects acid into the men's brains. Somebody that wouldn't interact with him or wouldn't talk, but would be alive and available for him to have sex with. I mean, that's that kind of magical thinking that you think that only a crazy person would think like that, or somebody who was psychotic. Thus ends an unbelievable confession. Detective Murphy squeezed everything out of Dharma during the interrogation. 
But in court, the Milwaukee Monsters defense attorney pleads insanity. We're on. Psychologists attest to Dahmer's various psychological disturbances, including schizophrenia. The ongoing trial is in danger. Well, it's our job to remain cool and calm, confident and comfortable, because if you show any distress, they're going to jump on you. If you get everything screwed up, you're going to lose your testimony. We had to prove sanity, and I think we did. In the end, the court rejects the plea and sentences Jeffrey Dahmer to life in prison. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. One year later, Dennis Murphy visits Dahmer in prison. And at that time, he had went from 190 pounds of muscle to 215 pounds of kind of flab. He didn't have the grip he had before. He told me he, was, he found God, he was good with it, and that he was going to be dead in six months, and he wanted to die. It takes longer. Two years after the verdict, another prisoner beats Dahmer to death in his cell. To this day, Dennis Murphy still has a strange feeling, somewhere between satisfaction and fear that there might be more people like Dahmer. I'd go home and I'd tell my wife about it, but I wouldn't go into all of how he, what he did. I just said he cut up the body parts and disposed of them. And my children even heard it. But I said, this is one in a million. I don't want you to think people are all like this. But there are more of them. Also in Russia, shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, chaos and poverty reign. Poverty that one man takes advantage of. Alexander Spesivtsev traps his victims with the help of his own mother. I don't think you'll, you can ever prepare yourself for that type of um, scene that you're coming across. For investigators, unbelievable. Such people shouldn't be allowed to live. How and after how many murders do they stop the man who is perhaps the most ruthless killer of all time? Russia, more precisely, deeper Siberia, Novokuznetsk, a city of half a million inhabitants. The anonymity of the big city helps one man to kill unnoticed. But not just anyone, he kills children. Investigators chase him for seven months. The head of the team, Alexander Oreshin. I had nothing to do with serial killers before. I had often been to crime scenes, but serial killers? Spazivtsev was my first. As a matter of fact, the first for the whole city. In June of 1996, people out for a walk find strange things in the Aba River. Oreshin is one of the first at the scene. His team searches the riverbank for five days. They find feet, hands, human bones. If you don't have the identities of the victims, there's no place to start with who are these w girls, when did they disappear, where were they taken from. All you've got is a body that has no identification. After finding the body parts, Oreshin is certain very, very many people have been killed in Novokuznetsk, all of them children. When we found the body parts, it was a horrible sight. The whole team immediately developed ideas for how we could catch the killer. Suspicions range from trade in organs to child prostitution to a psychopathic serial killer. The last conjecture is correct, but Inspector Oreshin still has no leads. And investigating is difficult in that period. At the beginning of the 1990s, Russia is in upheaval. 
massive poverty reigns. If you look at Russia at this time, uh, the USSR is breaking down, uh, there's a very poor economics, people are starving. Men got drunk or left their families. Mothers fought for every job and drank too. Children were no use to anyone. This was the population the victims came from. No one was looking for them. One man takes advantage of precisely this. His name, Alexander Spesistsev. But Inspector Oreshin does not yet have any leads. Where and for whom should he even look? Naturally, we took as many children off the streets as possible and returned them to their parents. But starving children go back out on the street after a short time. And never come back home. In the next five months, over 70 children disappear, none older than 13. Police comb the area around Novokuznetsk. The whole city, every suspicious apartment. It seems unfathomable that an individual could be capable of abusing children in this way. And the question, of course, is where, where does it come from? How does a human being turn into a savage child killer? The killer grows up in a family plagued by domestic violence. His father rapes drinks and abandons the family when Spesistsev is 13. You see a very dominant father who's abusive to the family. He's abusive to the son, to the mother, probably emotionally abusive, sexually abusive, physically abusive. As Alexander grows up without a father, he takes on the role his father had once occupied. Spesistsev, the new head of the family, is always an outsider. Early on, he shows signs of psychological disturbances. He gets married, kills his wife during a fight, and is put in a mental institution. The methods of the Soviet psychiatric ward were based on beatings, fetters, and injections. After three years, Spesistsev is released as a psychological wreck. Four months after the bodies are discovered on the riverbank, three girls disappear from a bus stop. A woman lures them to her house. Everyone is under suspicion, but not Spesistsev. Everyone thinks he's still in the institution. In reality, Spezitsev had been out for a while, only we didn't know, despite having asked. That was a big bureaucratic mistake, a mistake that cost many innocent children's lives. As so often happens, a coincidence brings about the crucial shift and sets Inspector Oreshin on the right trail. After a pipe burst, Plumbers try to check the apartment where Spesistsev and his mother, Ludmilla, live. But no one lets them in. The workmen inform the police. Inspector Oreshin will never forget what he finds here. We came into the apartment, and what we saw was horrifying. There were children's clothes scattered everywhere. There were body parts in the bathtub. And Olga was lying in the living room, severely injured. I don't think you'll, you can ever prepare yourself for that type of um, scene that you're coming across. Horeshin steps onto a savage battlefield. Even as an expert, it's hard for me to understand how someone can be capable of committing this level of brutality over such a long period of time with such a vulnerable population. In the apartment, a severely injured and traumatized girl. How should you feel when you see dead children and an injured 13-year-old girl whose eyes register only pure dread? But there is no trace of Spesistsev. He escapes from the roof. The same day, the girl provides the missing information. 
Who brought you to the apartment? A granny. How did she do it? Did she ask you for help? She couldn't open the door? No. That's why she took you upstairs? Yeah. It turns out the killer's mother lures the victims into the trap, the home she shares with her son. She was basically his, his, his lackey to do whatever he wanted. The same day, Inspector Oreshin arrests the mother, Ludmila Spasivtsev. In addition, the police find photos of children and countless articles of children's clothing. Oreshin is certain the child killer of Novokuznetsk lives here. The mother, Ludmila, finally confesses and admits to having trapped the children. Oreshin keeps the apartment under observation and hopes that the son will come back. For guys like this, this is the only life they have ever known. This is where he lives. Where is he going to go? And in fact, the killer does come home and he's arrested. During the interrogation, mother and son quarrel. What kind of son are you? For months I dispose of your bodies. Just yesterday it was again four trash cans. And now you say it's my fault because they want to know where the bodies are. Say where they are. How are you not ashamed? Why are you so mad at me? Such an ingrate. I'm not angry. The mother probably was not necessarily a willing accomplice. If she was on her own, she probably would not have got up to this type of behavior. The true nature of the strange relationship between mother and son is never clear. The court sentences Ludmilla to 13 years in prison. Her son, Alexander, is judged insane. Since then, he has lived in a psychiatric ward. Inspector Oreshin believes the killer has more than 80 children on his conscience. To be honest, I feel only disgust now. Everything having to do with Spasivtsev. It cost us so much energy to solve this case. But there is no justification for such people being allowed to live among us. Inspector Alexander Orashin will never forget the so-called Siberian tiger. He hopes the killer will never be released from the psychiatric ward. To this day, he's under lock and key. Schwalbach am Taunus, a small city near the metropolis Frankfurt am Main. On September the 10th, 2014, a young woman is cleaning out the garage of a recently deceased father. Manfred Zeil, beloved by all, a seemingly kind-hearted man and husband. But behind this garage door lurks a dark secret. You have, you know, the two sides of Seal that were so well concealed to everybody around him that they're not even discovered until after his death. When Zale's daughter opens two plastic barrels, she can't believe her eyes. They contain body parts. It's the remains of a prostitute named Britta Diallo. Is Manfred Zeil a woman killer? Did he mutilate the victims so savagely? Forensic psychiatrist Manuela Dudek also wonders about one question in particular. Was it him? And if yes, why? There were many individual body parts. Many body parts make it possible to create a new person. The second idea is related to cannibalism. The muscles can be removed and the meat actually eaten. A dismembered body, highly unusual, and normally not an isolated instance. Police form the so-called Alaska unit and investigate the deceased Zeil. A search of his house turns up over 30,000 pieces of violent pornography. Pornography, while not inherently bad, can provide inspiration, if you will, for later sexual crimes.
that he was essentially acting out some of the scenarios that he had in this uh, uh, pornographic films or pornographic photographs of these victims. He's essentially reproducing the same dynamic in his murders. An image in Sale's pornography collection resembles the wounds of the dead bodies in the barrel. Is there another side to Zeil? A dark side that no one knows? People who exhibit sexual sadism often have fractured pasts. Their childhood was not necessarily the kind one imagines is proper. It was marked by neglect and very possibly by physical assault as well. But in Manfred Seel's past, everything is entirely normal. He graduates high school, gets married, plays in a jazz band. His job, he runs a household clearance business. On the surface, always the friendly neighbor. This is a very frustrating case because you don't have an offender that can give you answers, can give you pointers, etc. So there's a lot of speculation as to the whys. Uh, why did this happen? Why did he do certain things? Were there more victims? Detectives focus their investigation on the Frankfurt street walking scene in the city's Bahnhofsviertel. Fazil's victim is a prostitute. Officers question numerous people in the red light district and learn that Zeil was a regular customer. Every Saturday, he looked for women engaging in sadomasochism. So we're making the linkage in cases. We're saying, okay, these cases are in, these cases are out, but now who's the offender? So we move from victims to linkage to offender. Here, we've got offender and no victim. So now we're trying to work back, like where, where do these pe people come from? So you have to look more at the behavioral, the victimology, how the person was murdered, where they were found, etc., and do what we call a behavioral linkage to see which cases can be included. The Alaska unit reopens all missing persons and unsolved homicide cases in the Frankfurt area. They investigate whether there are similarities with the victim Britta Diallo, and they hope to find further evidence regarding Manfred Zeil. Well, like a lot of serial killers, Seal is selecting victims that are basically available and vulnerable. Police look specifically at mutilated victims. The severed body parts in Manfred Zeil's barrel suggest that he liked to keep souvenirs. Psychologists call this trophy lust. Could Zeil have hidden it from his family? Psychopaths live out their perversions with prostitutes rather than at home because they learn early on to wall off their aggressions and then let them out in a controlled way. They leave their families unharmed because their social sense works well. After two years and over 230 pieces of information from the city's inhabitants, the Alaska unit is certain. Manfred Zeil is the killer, and he was responsible for even more deaths. Here, in the bushes of Highway A661, is where he probably killed a prostitute named Dominique Monrose in December of 1993. To this day, her head is still missing. Gisela Singh, Hatisa Arul Keroglu, and Gudrun Abel, all were probably also left mutilated by Manfred Zeil. He always keeps a body part with him. A trophy is a fantastic stimulus. It reminds you. It can give you a smell, a sight, a taste, and it can bring back to you all of those fantasies and realities, and you can relive the crime. The climax, a child murder in 1998. It shocks the entire country. Even if it's still not entirely certain, investigators believe that Zeil was behind it too. The killer cuts the boy's throat and cuts off his testicles and a piece of his thigh. The injuries also fit the 13-year-old boy. We saw that he was strangled, that he was mutilated, 
and that there were also injuries to the genital area. Whether Tristan indeed died at Manfred Seel's hand has not been proven. But lots of evidence support the theory. The investigation is still open, for the detectives a burden. You almost have to narrow your focuses and try not to torture yourself over the things that you'll probably never get answers to, because unless he left a detailed diary of what he's done, we're not going to have insight into his mind. It's uncertain how many people Zeal really killed. The dead man lies silent in his grave. His wife is no longer alive. Other inquiries peter out. People like Manfred Seel are able to live as social beings and hide their dark side. And they only take action when a victim comes along. Nevertheless, even after Manfred Seel's death, the Alaska unit is able to prove he committed five murders. They're still investigating five other murders. To this day, no one knows why he did it. The killer has taken his dark secret to his grave. Manuela Dudek and the Alaska unit still believe Sale committed many more murders. But no matter what, he is going down in history as the Hessen Ripper, as one of the worst criminals in Germany, and he takes his place among people who managed to kill unnoticed. They hide the evil behind a facade. But in the end, investigators find them all, whether before or after their death, the most ruthless killers of all time. <laughs>